Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Well, there's some interesting stuff in the news. First of all, as you know, seasonal influenza is season is about to begin. Not quite started yet, but it's about to begin. And each year for the past oh, two decades, uh, flu is always a big time, uh, big problem about this time of the year. There, it causes anywhere between 100,000 and 700,000 uh, admissions to hospitals and anywhere between 5,000 and 50,000 deaths each year. So influenza is a really big problem. We have ways to manage that, that's vaccines, but the vaccine use, as you know, for reasons unclear to me, uh, has been falling. So in order to address that issue, the FDA has been in the process of working with the manufacturers of flu mist to try and make it readily available for people at home. So they've just approved that this nasal spray will be available. It's been available for people up from 5 to 49, but it's been authorized for kids over the age of 2 up to any age. So this is a good opportunity for people who are afraid of needles to be able to get this uh, uh, nasal vaccine uh, and do it at home. Uh, it is, it's an interesting, the, the nasal f uh, flu is a mist that contains an influenza virus that has been adapted to live at cold temperatures, so at the tip of your nose, doesn't live at high temperatures, and so it's actually a very good antigen. It's as good as, a, as the, the vaccine that's injected, so it's a really good opportunity for people who want to do it at home or are afraid of needles, but hopefully that will increase the vaccine usage. As I mentioned, this is the beginning of flu season, but if you look at influenza activity, here it is, this uh, September 14th, still not here, usually arrives around October or November, perfect time to start getting your vaccine now, so you'll be prepared. So the most in interesting thing in the news, obviously, uh, lately has been avian flu or bird flu. We've been following it uh, through the uh, uh, Texas Epidemic Public Health Institute, TEFI, which follows wastewater in analysis in, uh, in the state of Texas. And the interesting thing, that this was published uh, in the New England Journal last week, there are 10 cities and 10 sites that have actually been detecting a significant amount of H5N1. And you can see it's all over them. Blue circles are all the sites. It's in many of the cities, Houston, Austin, Fort Worth, and Dallas, but other in El Paso, many other communities. So there's a lot of H5N1 that's around in wastewater. Now that could be from humans, it could be from animals, but it's in wastewater. If you look at the CDC report for what's, how's it been in humans, there have been 15 cases reported since 2022. Obviously we're very worried that avian flu will be a, could be the next big global pandemic, but there have only been 15 cases in humans. Four followed um, uh, exposure to dairy cattle, uh, 10 uh, it followed exposure to poultry, and there's that one case I mentioned last week uh, with the woman in Missouri who didn't have any obvious, uh, uh, any obvious contact with animals, which is a concern. But the other area the concern is that it's all over the place. It's, it's really, there's uh, over 100 million poultry. It's in a lot of wild birds. There's 213 dairy cattle that have been involved. And the concern is it used to be in birds. You can understand wild bird going to pol poultry. A few years ago, there was a big outbreak in sea lions. That was the first one time a bird flu actually adapted to mammals. And now it's in cattle. Cattle and pigs are both close to humans. It's a real concern. So what's the CDC doing? It's monitoring. It's monitoring many different people. It's monitoring 5,000 people who are in that industry, their poultry or cattle. It's tested 230 people so far. In my view, that's probably not enough. Uh, based on the amount of virus that's present, the fact that it's now in cattle, uh, I personally think that they should be developing uh, a vaccine right now and getting us prepared and probably ought to be vaccinating cattle, you know. And while they're at it, they can vaccine pigs too. Anyway, the other thing about TEFI, as you know, it follows wastewater and we've been following all the viruses. The good news is that ECHO 11, I've mentioned that, that's uh, a virus that often infects newborns, uh, is decreasing. Uh, enterovirus uh, D68 is still high. That's, a, that's a, a, a virus that causes an upper respiratory infection. Uh, parvo's down, heart parvovirus is down, MPOX is down. And the good news also is SARS-CoV-2 seems to be down. So if you look nationally at the data for, for COVID, uh, emergency uh, visits are down for 75 and 65 year olds. Remember I mentioned it was unusual that under the age of one and 12 to 17 year olds were showing up, but those are dramatically decreased. 
And of course, hospitalizations, the lagging indicator, are also falling. That's about 65. This is the national data for wastewater. As you can see, it's sort of peaked up here and is now beginning to finally fall. And these are the individual sites represented by red dots being very high. Orange is falling. And you can see there's a lot more orange in that map than there was previously. And I mentioned this before, but I think it's worth uh, saying again, about two thirds of the schools in the Harris Independent School District have positive uh, COVID in their wastewater, which means everybody who's got kids, every grandparent that's got a kid that's at school age is gonna be exposed to COVID. So you just be ready for it. And the best way to get ready for it, of course, is to get vaccinated. Uh, nothing has really changed in terms of the dominant variant. It's still KP 3.1, that's here. Uh, that has been emerging over the last several years. And if uh, you'll remember, I've show, I like to show this relatedness uh, figure because it shows where all the vaccine targets are. KP3 is the dominant strain right here, but KP2, closely related, is the current vaccine target, which is why you should get the current vaccine. Last year's uh, vaccine was to XBB 1.5, which is now pretty far removed, and so would not be as good a match. Uh, interestingly enough, the Novavax target, which is a protein, not mRNA, is JN1, which was the dominant strain last year. So really, to me, the mRNA vaccines, either Pfizer or Moderna, are the ones to get. You should get them now, and you should also, at the same time, get your flu, flu shot. So you can get them both at the same time. Uh, no problem with that. Uh, there, we've, we talked about this XCC variant, which is a recombinant between KP3 and another strain, K KS1, that's very closely related. Always makes us nervous when there's a recombinant because it means there's a lot of differences that can be merged together that might give it the ability to escape uh, immune surveillance. And so far, it's detected in many different parts in the state, but it has not become a dominant strain. And so it's not yet being followed, but we're all keeping an eye on it. I like to look at what's happening in the Travelers Program. Those are planes and airports that are uh, involved. There are eight major entry points to the United States. And you can see you know, uh, COVID is dropping in the wastewater from the Travelers Program. And as I mentioned, KP3 is the dominant strain in people coming to this country. Not quite as much as we have here. Uh, and there's some JN1 and others that make you think that they're kind of lagging behind the United States. I wanted to spend some time today on a really great paper that came out in Cell. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of controversy of the origin of COVID. You know, is it a lab leak? Was it something that happened in nature? Uh, there's, this paper got some press because it really is very good data supporting the fact that it probably emerged in na nature. Now, what about this paper? These are scientists from the United States, Australia, and Europe who got samples from the Chinese CDC, the equivalent of the Chinese CDC, that are at the time of the very first part of the outbreak. So they got 800 uh, samples of genetic material that was actually uh, uh, obtained from that Hunan uh, market on January 1st. So that's like right as the, uh, was actually the day after it was reported by Chinese uh, authorities that there was a, an outbreak. And so this was the very earliest genetic material that was available. And they sequenced these uh, samples from raccoon dogs, civets, uh, civet cats, and bamboo rats. And basically, uh, what it suggests very strongly, because they found the virus in those animals, it was very closely related to the very first sequence, it sort of suggests that it emerged right, out of, right at the Hunan market. Uh, the common ancestor uh, that, was, that was circulating at, at the time was identified in the market. The DNA analysis from those animals was closely related. And I wanna show you one thing that's really important. It's a little bit of a technical thing, but these animals that they sampled were positive. It was in the market. There was a viral hotspot in those, where those samples were taken. And the circulating viral strain in man which is that MRCA, that's the most co recent common ancestor, is surrounded by strains that were isolated from the animals. This kind of surrounding makes it strongly suggest that they were all, they all came from the same sort of common ancestor. If it was stuck over here and not, and not associated with them or in the middle of them, you'd think differently. But in the world of looking at genetic analysis, this strongly suggests that it developed in the, that it was in the Hunan market. Now, 
how it got to the market, if for those of you who still want to find other reasons to believe that it wasn't nature, uh, you got to figure out how it got there. We don't know how it got there, but it definitely was there in that market. That was the hot spot in that where it, that's where it started. Even most of the publications said that in the press have said, look, this is the best evidence ever that it strongly suggests it came out of nature. I, I've been saying that all along, but you know, this is the best evidence. I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, this week we announced three new transformative gifts to support the future uh, of the School of Medicine and Health Professions uh, at Baylor College of Medicine. That is the Lilly and Roy Cullen, uh, Cullen Tower. A uh, big shout out to the Brown Foundation, the DeBakey Medical Foundation, and the Seraphim Foundation for their generous support uh, to this important project. In addition to naming the education building after the Cullen family, we announced that the campus on which it's located will be uh, named the Michael E. DeBakey Health Sciences Park. Really generous family, families that have helped us move forward our medical education programs. Also, Baylor and Rice University have received a $2.8 million grant from the NIH, uh, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, uh, for research on reducing inflammation and lung damage and acute respiratory distress syndrome in patients. And I want to congratulate Dr. Ravi Ganta, Professor of Surgery at Baylor, and Omid Vaish, Professor of Bioengineering at Rice, for co-leading this project. Of course, I want to congratulate the Astros. Astros once again com com uh, clinched their uh, division title. This is the fourth division in a row, the eighth time in a row that they've been in the playoffs. So go Astros, can't wait for them to win another uh, World Series. And of course, this week is the beginning of Rosh Hashanah. Uh, I want to wish everybody uh, who is celebrating Rosh Hashanah happy and uh, health, healthy New Year. Shana Tova, and I can't wait to see you next week.